I found that kind of funny. We're going to have a moving service, which sort of threw off my plans because I was going to do a stationary. <laughs> <clears throat> I've always kind of dreamt of being a mime. Just everyone has a dream, and that's mine. Hey, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome here. Whether you're here for the first time or the 400th, I'm just so honored and so grateful that you would choose to spend this time together with us. We're in this series called The Upward Fall. It's going to take us all the way uh, up to and including the Easter weekend. We, we called it The Upward Fall because uh, history hangs on the events of that first Easter weekend. But it's a paradox, isn't it? Because it starts with the crucifixion. It's really incredible when you think, think about it, the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, died on a Roman cross on Good Friday. In a sense, if, if you were there and you witnessed those events, you would have to assume that all was lost. But the truth is, all was about to be won. The truth is, if you were there and you witnessed those events, you, you would have been uh, pretty sure that darkness was descending. But the truth is, hope was just about to rise. It's the upward fall. To me, it's unequivocal, eternal proof that God really does right straight with crooked lines. And I'll tell you truthfully, for me, I'm just praying for a miracle in my life this Easter. I, I, I don't want Easter to just to be a, a, a long weekend or just a part of the rhythm of the church calendar. I, I, I want to push pause. I want to stop. And I, I want to see uh, the hope and the power and glory and the joy of that first Easter play out in my life this Easter. And months ago, as I was looking ahead to this series, I thought, I want to prepare my heart the same way that Jesus prepared his heart and the hearts of the disciples for that first Easter. And so what we're doing is specifically, we're looking at, at, the, at the path that Jesus took uh, in what theolo theologians call the Passion Week. That week leading up to and including the Easter weekend. And what I'm asking for me and what I'm asking for you is that God would do a miracle in us, that he would prepare our hearts this Easter just as Jesus prepared his heart in the hearts of the disciples that Easter. And so last week we started out by talking about a, a party that took place six days before Good Friday in a little town called Bethany, two miles outside of Jerusalem. Probably the most Unusual party in all of human history. Not a birthday party, not an anniversary party, but a thank you that I am not dead anymore party hosted by Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. So today I want to pick up the story from there. That was Saturday. The next day was Sunday. People refer to that next day as actually Palm Sunday. So Jesus and his disciples leave Bethany and they head towards Jerusalem. A along the way, Jesus sends two of his disciples into a village called Bethpage, and in Bethpage they borrow the colt of a donkey. And they bring the colt of a donkey to Jesus, and he rides on that donkey's colt down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. And as he's riding, crowds are gathered, large crowds, and they're, and they're cheering and they're shouting, and they're, they're laying down their cloaks, and they're laying down palm branches as Jesus rides. And what's spectacular to me is that 500 years before Jesus stepped into human history, there was a prophet named Zechariah. And he saw this scene 500 years before it happened. And he wrote about it in the Old Testament book of Zechariah chapter 9. It says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And if you ask me to kind of express that in, in maybe the way that we would say it today, it, it would go something like this. Salvation is here. Salvation is here. Salvation is really, really, really here. And I want you to imagine the scene as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on, on the colt of a donkey and, and the Pharisees and, and, and some teachers of the law, some religious Jews, they run up to Jesus and they say, you must tell this crowd to shut up. Tell them to stop saying that. Be, because when they say salvation is here, they're implying that you are the 
savior, and that's blasphemy. So tell them to shut up. Time up. As a historian, there's something I need you to know. When, when I'm talking about the fact that I want to follow the footsteps of Jesus in that first Easter, I want you to know I'm talking about history, not a made-up story. It's really important that we kind of settle on that. I, I don't know what kind of church background you come from, whether this is your first time in church or, or what you've been told or what you've come to believe, but I really need you to know that historians all over the world today, a vast, 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 vast majority would tell you that Jesus Christ, the story of him is history. It's not a made-up story. So when I stand here and I tell you that Jesus was born in a little town called Bethlehem, that he grew up in Nazareth, that at 30 years of age, he recruited 12 disciples and he traveled around for about three years teaching and preaching and, and healing and performing miracles, and that at the age of 33, that tide of public opinion turned against him and he was arrested, crucified. And three days later, the tomb was empty and, and Jesus uh, appeared to crowds of uh, up to 500 people after he rose again. What I'm telling you is I'm, I'm telling you history. It's sort of like me standing up here saying Canada became a nation in 1867. Or Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain in 1940. Now, I'm telling you history. Now, the implications you might make from what I'm telling you might vary widely. But, but this is history. There's a quote that I, I found just last night, actually, from a, a pretty famous author, historian, and atheist named H.G. Wells. This is what he said. I am a historian. I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. Now, you might be a skeptic and when, I t and when I tell you that, I would say a skeptic is a good thing. To me, a skeptic is a truth seeker. You want to know the truth. You should look into it. There's something interesting, though, that happens when the, when, when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law come to Jesus and they say, shut these people up. They're saying that you are the savior of the world. And that brings to mind something else because, like I said, a vast majority, if not every historian in the world today would tell you that Jesus lived and died and was purported to rise again. But there are some who will tell you, oh yeah, Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus is a good moral teacher. Jesus was a, 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 a neat, holy guru. But I need you to know that Jesus never claimed to be that. Because when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came to Jesus and said, shut these people up, they're saying that you're the Savior, uh, Jesus said, oh, if they're quiet, these stones will cry out. Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He said, oh, if, if these people don't praise me, the stones will. In the beginning, in the beginning, God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke the universe into existence, everything that exists, the galaxies and the stars, the solar systems and the planets, our planet, perfectly aligned and perfectly balanced for life. God created the universe. He created our planet. He, he separated light from darkness. He separated our land from water. He created vegetation. He created animals, land animals, and animals of the air, and animals of the sea. And behold, God looked at everything he had created, and he said, it is good. And then at the pinnacle of creation, in his own image, God created people, men and women, he created them with free will. And he said, I'm giving you dominion over creation. Dominion. 
It's an interesting word, d- dominion. I- here's another way I would say it. God said, you need, you need to take loving care, loving care. You, you need to look after creation. But, but God gave people free will, and somewhere along the line, something went really wrong. Instead of following in his path, they rebelled against God. And, and, and when that happened, we often talk as preachers, we talk about the fact that in that moment, humanity was broken. The human condition was broken, and that's true. But you know what else? Creation was broken. And the loving care that we were supposed to take of this creation, we have not done a great job of, correct? We've seen extinctions. We've seen pollution. We've seen climate change. We, we see today... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of landfills worth of garbage dumped into our oceans. It was not meant to be so. And when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, uh, the redemption plan that God has was accelerating, but the redemption plan he has is not just for people, it's for creation. I want you to think about that. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey and creation is leaning in. Mountains and forests and oceans and and rivers. The eagle that soars in the sky, the the, the wolf that howls, the lions and, 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 and the tigers and even the stones leaning in because they know one day all old is gonna be made new. All wrongs are gonna be made right. Not just for people, but for all of creation. A new heaven, a new heavens, and a new earth. It's interesting because as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, people refer to this as the triumphal entry. Triumph. It it sure is a different kind of triumph, though, isn't it, when you think about it? Jesus is riding on a donkey's colt, he's not riding on a war horse. He's not riding on a chariot. He's not all suited up in armor, leading legions and legions of soldiers. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey uh, with his ragtag group of followers alongside. It's a different kind of triumph. And the reason is, is because he's a different kind of king. He's a different kind of king. He didn't come for political or military conquest. In fact, just days later, after this triumphal entry of of who scholars call the King of Kings, theologians call the King of Kings, he would lay down his life and die on a cross in his last breaths, asphyxiated in his own blood. He's a different kind of king, don't you think? Others call him the Prince of Peace. But it's a different kind of peace, isn't it? Imagine the scene, right? Like, he's, he's riding into Jerusalem, and, 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 and people are laying down their cloaks, and they're laying down palm branches, and the, and the crowds are shouting, so, shouting, salvation is here, salvation is here, salvation is really, really here, and it's loud, and the, the Pharisees are running up saying, shut these people up, and Jesus is saying, if, if they shut up, the, the stones will cry out. It's kind of a chaotic kind of peace, don't you think? Anyone who's followed Jesus for more than five minutes know it's a, it's a different kind of peace. It's a chaotic kind of peace sometimes. I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Different kind of triumph. Different kind of king. Different kind of peace. It's a different kind of triumph. See, when, when the crowds were shouting, salvation is here, they were looking for military salvation. They were looking for political salvation. At that time, the Jewish nation was, um, was controlled and conquered by the Roman Empire. And so when they said salvation is here, what they wanted Jesus to do is stride into Jerusalem, and gather an army around him, overthrow the Romans. Political triumph. Military triumph. But that's not the kind of triumph that Jesus stepped into human history to bring. So much so, in fact, that these same crowds that on Sunday were, were, were shouting salvation is here just days later would be yelling, crucify him. Jesus came to bring a different kind of triumph, 
There was this preacher named Paul who said it this way in, in the first century. Jesus made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a different kind of triumph, don't you think? Jesus stepped into human history to defeat death by dying. That's interesting. He, he came to defeat death by dying. <coughs> um, to, to defeat something or someone, you need to face them. Does that make sense? You, you, you need to stand face to face to defeat them. Well, God can't die. God can't face death. So he sent his son into human history, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. And he died. He faced death, and he conquered it. It's a triumph that goes deeper than this world. And then he rose again so that we can too. In other words, what I'm saying is it's a triumph that goes further than this life. Jesus stepped through death into eternal life with the assurance that someday for you and for me it'll be the same and old will be made new, darkness will be made light, lost will be made found, and every wrong will be made right. It's a different kind of triumph. A couple weeks ago, Corinne was talking about um, how as a family we had a pretty tough 2009. And as I, as I tell you about my 2009, can I just be very clear? Some of you, you would say, man, I'm living in your 2009 right now, Mike. Or some of you might say, 2009 for you is nothing compared to what I'm going through. I acknowledge that completely. Life's hard sometimes, you know? I remember 2009. I hadn't thought about it for a long time until Corinne brought it up two weeks ago. But it was good. I thought about how in 2009 I realized that there are some people in the world who actually wish you ill. We had people in 2009 who actively plotted the destruction of our family. That sucked. We had others who, I don't think they wished us ill, they just said bad things about us. Sometimes behind our back, sometimes to our kids, and sometimes to us. That kind of sucks. And in 2009, there, 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 there was times when it felt like there was all these people in our life that had said to us, uh, hey man, I, I got your back. I love you. I'm your friend forever. And they deserted us. And sometimes it felt like we were completely and totally alone. Having said that, looking back now, I realize that we never were, but sometimes you can fool yourself into thinking that you're alone. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in the middle of 2009, even in 2010, I remember looking back and going, well, well what, what kind of life is this? What, what, what kind of triumph is this? You've been there, right? Like, what kind of victory is this? It's a, it's a different kind of triumph. Something crazy happened in 2009 and 2010. I kind of came to this place where I thought, man, no one approves of me. No, no one's pleased with me. No one validates me. And I, I would lie awake on Saturday nights for months and months and months and months and months and months and months, and I never slept. Never slept on a Saturday night. Tossed and turned and just never slept. No one's pleased. No one approves. No one validates. And all throughout those nights, all throughout those months and years, God was speaking to me just quiet voice, saying the same thing over and over and over again. I love you. Is that enough? I love you. Is that enough? I love you. Is that enough? 
And over time, it's not right away, but over time, you know what? The answer for me was, yeah. Yeah, it's enough. It's a different kind of triumph, don't you think? See, God didn't want those people <laughs> to, pl- to plot evil. He didn't want those people to desert me. But, but he used even those bad things to bring about something beautiful and something good. It's a different kind of triumph, don't you think? There's this old campfire song. Um, it's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And there, there's this one line that I was thinking of as I was preparing for today. Uh, it goes this way. It says, though, though none go with me, though none go with me, still I will follow. It's a different kind of triumph. Well, because he's a different kind of king. If you look through history, you'll see that a king and his people, they always have kind of like a, a, a bit of a one-sided relationship. The people exist to do things for the king. What does the king want from his people? Well, he wants taxes from them, for sure. <laughs> Quite often, he wants compulsory military service from them. He wants forced labor from them, and he absolutely, completely wants obedience from them. Like, do what I tell you to do. But man, Jesus is a different kind of king. Jesus stepped into human history not because he wants anything from you, it's because he has something for you. That's amazing. That's why he rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. See, salvation is here. Jesus didn't step into human history to take anything from us, but because he has something for us. He wants to take your sin and give you salvation. He wants to take your old and give you new. He wants to take your regret and your shame and your despair, and he wants to give you hope and light and joy and strength. A triumph, even, that goes deeper than this world and further than this life. And he wants to bring a different kind of peace. It's weird because they say that our culture might just be the most anxious culture in human history. Which is odd because when you think about it, man, we got a lot going for us, you know? We got a lot of prosperity. We got a lot of technology. We got, like, we, we got a lot of comfort. We got a lot of ease. And, and yet we're supposedly the most medicated culture in history. The most depressed and maybe the most anxious. I was reading a study the other day. They did a survey, the top 20 things that that we worry about in our culture. The top 20 things. So they came up with a list of the top 20. And I would break that top 20 list down into kind of three bigger categories, and that would be we worry about people, we worry about wealth, and we worry about health. People, wealth, and health. So number eight on the list of the top worries was uh, I worry about my physique. Number 12 was I worry about being ugly, which I kind of found interesting that people worry about more more about their physique than they do about being ugly, but whatever. I I said it to first service and no one thought it was interesting, just like you don't think it's interesting. I found it kind of interesting, okay? You know, number, number 13 was, I'm worried that my partner will stop loving me. And number 18 was, I'm worried that people won't like my clothes. We worry about people. Do me a favor. Um, Jesus came to bring a different kind of peace, right? It goes deeper than this world and further than this life. Look around you. Look, look at the people beside you. Now the person that, your second choice, look to them too. You, I just saw you just look one way the whole time, Mike. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what they think. You do not exist for their pleasure. You do not exist for their approval. You do not exist to be validated by them. It doesn't matter. And I know that sounds harsh. It does. Because what you might think when I say that is you might think, oh, well, if I live live that way, like, it doesn't matter what she thinks of me. It doesn't matter what he thinks of me. I'm just going to be a loose cannon going around and, and, and just treating people poorly. Actually, the opposite is true. 
See, when you think you need to establish your worth by the people around you, um, th- 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 then, then it's all about what you can get from them. You, you want validation from them. You want approval from them. You, 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 want, you want them to be pleased with you. So now it's a take relationship, you understand? But your value is not established by them. The value of anything is determined by what is given in exchange for it. What was given for you, the life of Jesus? It doesn't matter what they think. And here's what's crazy, is when you can live out of the approval and the validation of God through his son, Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, you don't need to take anything from people. You you can actually love them. Do you get what I'm saying? So, so now not, it's not about what I can get from you, it's about what I have for you. It's amazing. So the second main category of stuff that we worry about is, uh, is wealth. Number two, I worry about my debt. Number four, uh, I worry about my savings. Number nine, I worry about not being able to make rent this month. Valid, all of them. It's weird though, Je- Jesus said, uh, don't worry about where you're gonna live, what you're gonna eat, or what you're gonna wear. Don't worry about money. He went on to say that uh, you need to look up at the birds in the air and understand that not one of them falls from the air without your Father in heaven noticing. And you're worth infinitely more than them. And Jesus even said, look, look, look at the flowers in the field. See how beautiful they are. See how well clothed they are. Just as God looks after them, he'll look after you. I heard somebody say once uh, that money makes a great servant, but a horrible master. I would say it a little bit different. I would say money makes a great tool, but a horrible target. Money's a, a great tool, but a horrible target. Do you know what I mean? Like, like if, if, if money is my target, th- then I would assume that money will buy me happiness. But, but if that's true, if, if money would buy me happiness, then surely we'd be happy by now, wouldn't we? Like, if if you look at the population of history today, 99.999% of them would look at you and go, come on, man. Surely, you must be happy and joyful every minute of every day. Unless, of course, money is a great tool, but a horrible target. Um, reminds me of a, a quick story from Tuesday of last week. On Tuesday of last week, we got together with a group of us, and we went out to the river. And we went out to the river to, to celebrate something, because back in October of 2018, um, was gonna, well, our, our Maddie Hardy. Our Maddie was told in October of 2018 that she had terminal cancer. And on Monday of last week, she was told that she's cancer-free. Awesome. And so, on Tuesday, a group of us went out, Maddie's family and, and friends, and we just celebrated the difference in the words, uh, the difference between the two words terminal and miracle. From terminal to miracle. And I remember uh, Corinne, Corinne said, uh, she, gave us, she said, she gave us all a Sharpie, and she said, go find a rock and write something that for you would, would kind of summarize this last six months praying for a miracle. And we, we all just pretty much do what it, Corinne tells us to do. So we all went and found, <laughs> we, we, all, we all went and found a rock, and uh, I just remember writing on my rock, um, I, I think the three best prayers. The three best prayers, and I wrote them down on the rock. Uh, help me, thank you, and well. And then beside that, I just wrote on my rock so that I will never forget the waves and wind. They still know his name, and they always will. 
and then we sang a song. Um, Gibson played his guitar, and, and, uh, and we sang a song called Miracle. It was awesome. Then we went, went back to my, my place, and I wasn't really planning to share this, but I think it's somewhat important. Um, I barbecued burgers for everybody, and I introduced some of them who were brave to this new concept called a peanut butter burger. And it's just incredible. And the bold people among us, two, all of two of them, I actually tried it, and they didn't regret it. It has nothing really to do with the story, but I just felt I should tell you. <laughs> uh, but but, 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 but here, here's what I want to say. I want, like, you know what I never did throughout that entire time? I wasn't like, can we get this over with? Shut up the singing. I got to check my bank balance, man. No, no, no. Like, cool, you know, we're praying and stuff, but I, 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 just, I just need to look at my RSPs right now. Of course not. I know that. Like, money is a great tool, but a horrible target. But I just got to make sure I live in light of that truth, right? It's a peace that he brings. It's deeper than this world and further than this life. The number one thing that people worried about, by the way, is health. Number one worry, um, I, I worry about getting old. I find that worry kind of sad. Because it's not like worrying about getting struck by a meteor. You know what I mean? Like, here's the thing. It's going to happen. I hope you're going to get old. Number three, was, number three worry was getting sick. Somewhere in the top ten was getting wrinkles. I sure get that, though. <laughs> uh, no, obviously not the wrinkles part, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but man, like, if this world is all there is, man, wh whatever it takes, plastics, or, like, wh whatever, prolong, like, if this world is all there is, it's scary. But I told you, Jesus came to bring a peace that goes deeper than this world and beyond this life, right? L l let me break it to you, those who worry about worry number one, getting older. You are, your body is going to wear out one day, but you will never wear out. Your mind is going to wear out one day, but you will never wear out. So Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. I would suggest to you that this truth is self-evident. We all know at the core of who we are, there's got to be more to life than this. So death for you won't be a termination, it'll be a transition into eternity. When the old will be made new, when the wrong will be made right. A new heavens and a new earth. I think about that a lot. I think about a new Chilliwack. And a new Mount Chiam, a new Cultus Lake. Recognizable, but infinitely more. A new Grand Canyon, a new Paris, a new London. I was talking to a guy the other day, he's moving to the Maritimes, he's so excited, and I'm excited for him. He showed me pictures of his place right on the Atlantic Ocean, incredible. And we were saying, you know, uh, we'll, we'll never have a chance in our life to, to, to see all of Canada, not even close. And I said, I'll, I'll eventually see it all. I'll see it all. And so will you. We'll, we'll go together. It'll be a new Valley View, Alberta. <laughs> well, the one I'm thinking of, it's about 20 minutes north west of Redyer. It's a group of subdivisions, and in the middle of the group of sub, uh, there's a subdivision of acreages, and in the middle of it, there's a rink, a hockey rink. At night, the lights come on, and we'll be out there, sometimes together, sometimes all by ourselves. And as you skate, you hear the sound that your blades make on the fresh ice. You see your breath. You get to the boards, and you lean out over. Outside of the glare of the lights, you look up, you see the stars. New heavens, new earth. 
and you whisper, all this for us? For us? Yeah. For us. She's a different kind of triumph. Deeper than this world and far beyond this life. Because he's a different kind of king who brings a different kind of peace. So that was Palm Sunday. The next day was Monday. Normally that's how it works. Sunday and then Monday. And uh, Monday, Monday was amazing because Jesus walked into the, cha- the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, he was mad. Because there was these religious Jewish people there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and what they were doing is they were, they, they, they were teaching people that God's relationship, that God wanted something from people. They were putting all these barriers up between people and God as, as if he wanted something from them, their obedience, their, their, their this and their that, and they were exploiting people. And Jesus came in and he started flipping tables over and he drove them out of the temple. Tuesday, something similar happened. Jesus was preaching a sermon and then a bunch of Pharisees gathered around him and, 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 and he stopped and he gave to them what's called the seven woes. Woe to you. Woe to you, Pharisees. You spend your life teaching people that God wants something from them when really I am evidence that he has something for them. Scholars can't really pin down what happened on that Wednesday. The best that they can come up with is that Jesus and his disciples went back to Bethany and they spent the day there. Just a day of quiet preparation for the acceleration of events that was going to start on Thursday. We're going to talk a lot more about Thursday next week, but I just want to give you one thing to think about before I close. Thursday, the day before Good Friday, Jesus sat his disciples down and he said this to them. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is my command. Love each other. as you have been loved, love. As you prepare your heart for Easter, as I prepare my heart for Easter, I want to love the way that I've been loved. How, how are you doing with that? You, lo- you loving the people in your family? If, there, if there's an apology that has to be given, uh, can you make it today? If there's forgiveness that has to be extended, can you extend it today? How are you doing with your family? How are you doing with your friends? How are you doing with the people in this room? See, for me, when Corinne brought up 2009, it, it opened up for me this, this part of me that, again, I had to remind myself, got to let it go. Got to let it go. Got to forgive. Got to let it go. It, 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 is there a relationship that needs to be reestablished? Can you get to work on that today? Is there an encouragement that needs to be given? Can you give that encouragement today? Can, can we be known as the church that loves as they have been loved? <sighs> That'll change the world. That'll change the world. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you. You bring a different kind of triumph that goes deeper than this world and further than this life. And even times when it feels like everything in my life is out of control, you are always completely in control. Thank you. Thank you that you're a different kind of king. Today, again, Jesus, I remind myself, I hand you my sin and my shame and my guilt and my regret, and I take from you forgiveness, salvation, hope, strength, power. Thank you that you bring a different kind of peace. A peace that goes deeper than this world and beyond this life. Jesus, I pray that in our relationships, in our families, in our friend circles, in this city, in this church, none of us here are perfect, 
but we are so loved. And just, I, I ask that you would help us to love the way that you have loved us. Give us the strength, give us the patience to love as we've been loved. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. See you next week. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you at any of our three Sunday services held at Sardis Secondary School on Stevenson Road in Chilliwack, British Columbia. For more information, please visit southsidelife.com.